X-rays for the localization for the IUCDs, it can be used. Just one word for while evaluating X-rays in cases of females presenting with pain. Sometimes we will see this uh, TL bands, but those has to be identified as small radio opaque shadows or metallic densities. Bilateral symmetrical in the pelvis should not be confused with renal stones. Okay, let's start with CT scan first. So what are the disadvantages of CT scan? I have put the disadvantages first because CT scan is used only in special conditions while evaluating female pelvis and we should be aware of that. So the most important disadvantage is radiation. The risk contrast reactions in CT are more compared to MRI. In cases of renal failure, we cannot use CT scan. And most important, CT scan has got a very poor soft tissue contrast compared to both ultrasound and MRI. So when I say poor soft tissue contrast, uh, let's see what do I mean by it. So this is a plain sagittal CT scan image. Uh, the first image is a plain scan, second image is a contrast scan. Now if you see in the first image, the uterus, it looks like just a lump of soft tissue. We cannot really differentiate where is the endometrium, where is the junctional zone, where is, what is the myometrium. Uh, so any identifying any pathologies in this would be really difficult. Uh, in the central part of the endometrium, of course, here we can see the IOCD, which is a potential use for CT scan. In the second image, if we see, which is a contrast scan, even with contrast, we see although we are able to identify the endometrium separate from the myometrium, but still it would be difficult to pick up any subtle pathologies say, like endometrial polyp or endometrial carcinomas or even small myometrial lesions we won't be able to pick up in a contrast CT scan also. So that is the limitation of CT scan, poor soft tissue contrast. Now let's compare it with how do we see it in MRI and ultrasounds. So the first image is a sagittal titubated image of uh, MRI. Now here if you see behind the bladder, you, we can see the uterus and we can very clearly delineate the central endometrium then surrounding it, there's a high point intense zone called as the transition zone. And then there's an intermediate signal intensity myometrium. So this is the normal zonal anatomy, which can be seen on MRI, clearly delineating the three different zones. And any pathologies would be very obvious. That too, without any contrast, just on a plain MRI. The second image is a stirvated image. Sometimes the differentiation of the zones may not be very clear in this plain T2 image. So we use stir image where the differentiation stands out more starkly as is apparent in these images. Okay, coming to ultrasound. So first one is a transabdominal ultrasound, second is a transvaginal ultrasound. Compared to CT, if we see here again, we can see the zonal anatomy of the uterus much better. We can see a hyperechoic central endometrium, a small band of hypoechoic appearing transitional zone, and then a myometrium. Uh, this difference stands out again more clearly in transvaginal ultrasound. Okay, now coming to the identification of the ovaries, how do ovaries look on a plain CT scan as the blue arrow points in the first image? It's again just seen as a simple soft tissue. We can't really differentiate between the stroma and the follicles. And many times it would be difficult even to separate it from the normal bowel. Compare it with the second ultrasound image, which we can see as the arrow is pointing out in the left ovary, the difference between the stroma and the follicles is very, very clear. Now, how does CT compares with MRI for evaluating ovaries? So even after giving contrast, the first image is a contrast CT scan as the arrow is pointing out. It is not of much use in really identifying the ovary or separating the stromas and the follicles or maybe different pathologies which you might see. Compare it with the second image, which is an ultra, sorry, actual titubated image of MRI. And as the arrow is pointing, we can very clearly see the stroma and the ovaries. So this is the advantage of ultrasound and MRI, a much better soft tissue contrast compared to CT scan. Okay. So what are the advantages of CT scan? Where can we really use CT scan? As we see, there are more disadvantages with CT scan, but definitely there are some specific advantages which CT scan offers to us. So first is, of course, IOCD localization. When we want to localize it precisely, CT scan would be much better than an X-ray. When we want to differentiate between certain densities and calcification, CT scan is excellent even compared to MRI. Of course, it, got, it offers us an advantage of multiplanar reconstruction compared to ultrasound. 
So that's how it is better in evaluating huge masses where ultrasound would be uh, limitations. Now it is also better than MRI for evaluating peritoneal metastasis and for evaluating lungs. So this is a very specific advantage of CT scan compared to ultrasound or MRI. Okay. So the first image uh, and the second image is the transvaginal ultrasound. The first is a longitudinal section and second is a cross section of the uterus. So here we see in the endometrium there is a linear echogenic shadow with posterior acoustic shadowing. We presumed it to be an IUCD but when we inquired with the patient she denied any history of IUCD. This is how actually a typical IUCD would look brightly echogenic linear structure in the endometrium with posterior acoustic shadowing. So now the confusion was whether the patient has forgotten about IUCD or there is some other metallic body or what is it. So let's see what the CT scan has got us to offer. A CT scan, a plain CT scan of the pelvis was done for this patient. The first one is a uh, soft tissue window and the second is simply adjusting the windows to the bony uh, appearance of the CT scan. So in the first image we see again a whitish thing in the uterus, central part of the uterus which can be an IUCD. But when we adjust the window we see that it is more like a calcium or like a bone similar in appearance to the uh, spine which we are seeing here. So we, all, we can also measure with the help of the software the exact density of the structure. So on measuring the density, we found it to be something like a below the range of 500, which is typical of calcification. Whereas a metallic IOCD, it would be in the range of 700 to 1000. So that's how we can clearly distinguish what exactly the structure which we are evaluating. Okay, now coming to peritoneal metastasis, as I said, CT scan is better. So here we see an actual CT scan image. The blue arrows are pointing some soft tissue deposits in the peritoneum. Of course, large deposits can be picked up with ultrasound or MRI, but small deposits would be really difficult to pick up with uh, ultrasound or MRI. And even large deposits, it's much more comfortable to pick up with CT scan. So here is another actual images of post contrast CT scan in a case of ovarian malignancy. And the first image is the arrows are pointing you can see a small soft tissue along the peritoneum close to the splenic flexure of the colon. Now this is something which would practically be impossible to pick up on ultrasound and even very difficult to pick up on MRI. Maybe retrospectively we might be able to pick it up on MRI. The second image is showing deposits along the diaphragm. So again the small deposits as I am telling it's very difficult to pick up on ultrasound or MRI, but very easy to pick up on CT scan. So that's where the specific advantage of CT scan is there for evaluating malignancies, the peritoneal deposits. And of course, for the evaluation of the lungs where we cannot use ultrasound and MRI has got a very limited role. Okay. Coming to huge lesions on ultrasound, we may have limitations to evaluate every nook and corner of the lesion and we may miss some small soft tissue nodule which is an important indicator for malignancy. So like in this patient, we are seeing some septations here and we might miss some small soft tissue nodule which might suggest assisted you know, carcinoma or something like that and on ultrasound. So when we do a CT scan and MRI for this patient, Comparing with MRI, what are the advantages of CT scan in evaluating huge lesions? So the first image is a sagittal T2 weighted image of the same patient showing a large cystic lesion. And if you see the blue arrow, it is pointing towards a small grayish band like thing, which can be confused whether it is some sort of artifact or is it real septation. Because if you see in the rest of the lesion also, there are lots of grayish band like things looking like waves which are actually a turbulence related artifact which we see with large cystic lesions in MRI. And occasionally for the inexperienced person, he may confuse it with bands uh, with the septations. Whereas when we compare with the CT scan of the same patient, actual CT scan, the second image, the arrow is pointing towards the septations which are very clearly standing out in the CT scan without any scope for confusion. Okay, having said that about the CT scan, now let's come about ultrasound. So what are the advantages? Of course, ultrasound is widely available. It is cheap. It is portable. It can be done bedside. It has got a much better soft tissue contrast compared to CT scan, which we have already seen. There is no radiation compared to CT scan. So definitely we don't have to worry whether the patient is pregnant or not. And where is 
Uh, there is a limitation for the MRI also. Sometimes we may not be very sure about the menstrual history of the patient and we may not want to risk doing an MRI. So in ultrasound, we don't have to worry about that and that all makes it the first choice of imaging. What are the certain disadvantages? As we have already discussed, for evaluation of huge masses, there might be certain limitations for ultrasound. For characterization of ethnic cell mass, there may be limitations. Adenomyosis, when we talk of ultrasound, can pick up or suggest, but it would be more confidently diagnosed on MRI, as we will see eventually. For diagnosing and picking up early cervical malignancy, we won't be able to pick up on ultrasound. And small peritoneal metastasis can be very easily missed with ultrasound. Okay, so let's see some common anatomy of the uh, uterus and the ovaries as seen on ultrasound before we go into the pathologies. So the first image is a sagittal transvaginal section of the uterus. The arrow is pointing to a linear blackish defect seen in the anterior wall of the uterus near the junction of the uterus and the cervix. So that's how a typical caesarean section scar would look like. And it is important for us to know the normal anatomy before we can pick up the abnormalities. Let's compare it with the second image, which is of a normal uterus without any uh, caesarean section scar, without any defect in the anterior wall. Okay. Now, the first image here, if you see, it's again transvaginal ultrasounds of two different patients. The first image at the site of the caesarean section scar, we see a small fluid collection, which is a very common finding, which we'll see while evaluating female pelvises. So this should not be confused with any other abnormalities or pathologies. Like here we see a small pocket of fluid is there without any clear wall, without any internal echoes or any sac-like thing. So this is a simple cyst at the site of the scar. Even if not a cyst, some amount of fluid collection is a common finding which we will see here. Now why does this become important? Because if you see in the second image of a different patient, as the arrow is pointing out at the scar site, you see a clear sac-like structure with a clear echogenic wall in the central gestational sac. So the second image is actually an ectopic pregnancy in the caesarean section scar. And that's why it's important for us to know how that's a simple cyst would look in the scar site and how an ectopic would look in the scar site. Okay. Now let's come to some commonly encountered ethnic cell pathologies, how they would look in MRI and ultrasound. So the top image is of a normal ovary, how it would look in an ultrasound. We will see few follicles, random distribution, no increased stroma. The below image is that of a polycystic ovary. So we will see an ovarian volume which is typically more than 10 ml. We will see more than 12 small follicles as per the revised criteria it is more than 20 follicles. The follicles are small in size about 2 to 8 millimeter. They have got a peripheral distribution which is classically described as a string of pearl appearance and increase in stromal volume. So polycystic ovarian syndrome as per the Rotterdam criteria it involves any two of the following out of the three. One is ovulatory dysfunction where it is a patient presents with oligomenorrhea and or anovulation. Second, clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism. And third, a polycystic ovarian morphology on ultrasound, either involving one or both ovaries. Not necessary that it should involve both ovaries. Even if one ovary is involved, we can consider it as the criteria. Now here it is important to know that it is very common to have a polycystic ovarian morphology without PCOS and vice versa, where we have a PCOS, but the ultrasound shows a normal ovarian morphology. And another word of caution which we should remember is that USG should not be used for diagnosing PCOS in adolescent females by age if we go less than 20 years due to high incidence of multifollicular ovaries in this life stage. Coming to a corpus luteal cyst, so the typical appearance of a corpus luteal cyst as seen in the ultrasound image, transvaginal ultrasound, it shows a diffusely thick wall, smooth or granulated contour, no flow or peripheral flow. As we can see, the second image is a power Doppler image, which is showing a ring of fire appearance as they describe it around the corpus luteal cyst, which can be alarming if somebody is not uh, aware of the normal appearance of the corpus luteal cyst. It can range from 2 to 10 centimeters in size. It can undergo complications like hemorrhage or rupture, and it can present with acute pain. 
So it becomes important for us to identify something as a corpus luteus versus an ectopic pregnancy when it is suspected in appropriate clinical situation. Coming to a simple follicular cyst, as the ultrasound image here, it shows in the left ovary, there is a clear cyst and uh, this is a fo simple follicular cyst. So what are the characteristics of a simple follicular cyst? It is typically thin walled or imperceptible wall, unilocular, clear fluid, no internal echoes, no septations, no soft tissues. It is very, very common and incidentally seen in reproductive age group. It resolves on its own in two to three cycles. Size, it can range from three to eight centimeters. Typically below the three centimeter, as per the definition, it should still be called as a follicle. When it grows beyond three centimeter, we call it as a follicular cyst. Now, what are the management implications? If it is less than five centimeter, we don't have to follow up. Between five to seven centimeters, they recommend an yearly follow up. And if it is more than seven centimeter, we should think in terms of a cystic neoplasm like cyst adenoma or cyst adenoma carcinomas. And we need to work up with that along with MRI. Okay. This is the color image of the same patient. The first image is showing a power Doppler image. When patient presents with these huge lesions in the ovary or in the adnex, we need to rule out torsion. Uh, so we have to have color imaging of such patients. So in the first image, it is very clearly seen that in the rest of the ovarian parenchyma, we are seeing normal vessels as also confirmed with the spectral pattern. The spectral pattern is necessary to differentiate whether the flow is a real flow or it is just some artifactual color dispersing. When we put the spectra and we get a spectral pattern, we are sure that we are, we are evaluating a vessel and not some artifact. Now compare it with the second ultrasound image where again we see a large follicular cyst in this patient but if we see when we put a color doppler image on this there is no flow visible in the ovarian parenchyma raising the possibility or of a ovarian torsion having said that let's come to what are the how ovarian torsion would look like so ovarian torsion typically we will get an enlarged ovary by definition it should be more than four centimeters Occasionally, the ovary could be a normal sized ovary even with torsion. We will see peripherally displaced small follicles, a central follicular stroma, Doppler, we can have variable findings depending upon whether it is partial torsion, complete torsion or intermittent torsion. In intermittent torsion, we may get even normal vascularity, partial torsion, only venous flow is obstructed, arterial flow is still present and complete torsion, of course, the entire flow would be absent. The another typical sign if present would be a whirlpool sign of the pedicle and some secondary signs is that we will see offline ovaries it would be present in the midline rather than typically in the right or left adnex arm and we will see free fluid. So what do we mean by a whirlpool sign of the pedicle? So these are the actual plain gray scale and the second one is a color Doppler image of a patient with torsion. In the adnex arm if you see the appearance is like that of a whirlpool which is much more standing out with the color Doppler image because of the twisted pedicle, the vessels, they look, give the appearance of a whirlpool, which is characteristic for ovarian torsion. It may not be present in all cases, but when present, it is a very helpful sign for us. Okay. When we are talking about torsion, sometimes uh, the cysts which are present, we might see few cysts which are really large in size in the case of torsion ovary. But this is a simple fluid collection which is happening. Now, this should not be confused with multiple cysts of an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. As we see in the second image, there is a large ovary with multiple cysts, but the flow is very much present in the ovary. So, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, typically the flow would be present and of course it would be bilateral. So, that's how we can, we should be aware. To not to confuse torsion with an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. How a uh, torsion would look like in MRI? So plane is an actual titubated image of the MRI and the second is a sagittal titubated image of the MRI. Of course, ovarian torsion is an emergency and most of the time we don't need or we should not wait for the MRI to confirm. But when we are not sure radiologically or clinically that there is an element of doubt, we are not suspecting torsion that we need to go for a confirmation, MRI comes as a very useful modality 
and the imaging findings would be more or less the same as we described in the ultrasound. So in the first image, if you see on the right side, ovary is normal, small ovary with few follicles as the blue arrow is pointing. And the left ovary, if you see it is bulky with central follicular stroma and peripherally arranged tiny follicles. In the second ultras, second MRI image, sagittal image, it is of a different patient. Here we see a really, really huge ovary. Now this should not be confused with an ovarian tumor. That's why it becomes important for us to know the appearance of an ovarian torsion in MRI, the where we don't confuse torsion with tumor. So this is a large ovary, but we see typically there is a central follicular stroma, peripherally displaced small follicles, which is a characteristic finding on MRI for torsion. Okay, let's come to some cystic lesions of the adenexa. So as the first ultrasound image, it is showing a cystic multilocculated lesion with some turbid fluid in the adnexa. So this is not a simple follicular cyst, obviously, because there are loculations, there's turbid fluid. So we have to think in terms of a cyst adenoma or a cyst adenocarcinoma. So we will see it shortly. So an action T2 weighted uh, image of the MRI was done for the same patient. It confirms the same finding, cystic lesion, multiple loculations. So uh, further imaging of this patient, this is an actual T1 weighted image. Here as the arrow is pointing out, we see the content of the fluid is not blackish. Normally in a T1 weighted image, we see fluid to be blackish or grayish, like the what is there in the urine of the bladder. So we have, that's how we can compare it. But we see here, the fluid is not very clear. It's not grayish or blackish, but it is more towards whitish intensity. But again, not white like blood or fat, which we'll see eventually how it looks like. So this raises the possibility of a mucin containing tumor rather than a clear tumor. So when we are talking of a cyst adenoma, it could be serous or mucinous. And such kind of appearance, we should think of a mucinous cyst adenoma. The second image is a T1 fat sat image with contrast showing some septal enhancement. Okay. So let's talk of uh, ovarian cyst with hemorrhage. Again, a very common condition. We may see some cysts in the ovary which undergo hemorrhage. So we should not confuse this with tumors or any other lesions like cyst adenomas or any other pathology. So how a typical cyst with hemorrhage would look? Here is a transvaginal ultrasound image showing left ovary with a lace-like pattern. So this is typical of a cyst with hemorrhage. And to the inexperienced person, he may uh, mistake it for a tumor, which we should take care. Other patterns which you may see is turbid fluid instead of a clear fluid. We may see fluid fluid level and we will not see an internal vascularity. That is an important point to differentiate a cyst with hemorrhage from an early small cyst adenomas. Normally cyst adenomas by the time they would present would be big in size. But when they are small in size, if we are confused whether it is a cyst with hemorrhage or cyst adenoma, we put a color Doppler image, we see no flow inside, then obviously it is a cyst. If we see flow inside, we have to think in terms of a cyst adenoma. So cyst would be relatively small in size compared to cyst adenoma. And most of the times it presents as an isolated incidental finding. When we see multiple bilateral large size cysts, with hemorrhage, we have to think of endometriosis. So having said that, let's come to see how the chocolate cyst of endometriosis would look like. So the first one is a grayscale ultrasound image and the second one is a Doppler image of a patient with endometriosis. So the first one, it shows a large cyst and as you see, there is the fluid is all turbid, it's not clear fluid. And then in the other adnexa also, we are seeing similar cysts. So when we see bilateral cyst containing turbid fluid or dirty looking cysts, but without any internal vascularity, these are the typical chocolate cysts of endometriosis. So an MRI was also done for the patient and MRI, although it is not many times required for confirmation, but nonetheless, if we want to have a confirmed diagnosis and if we want to be very confident what we are dealing with, so MRI definitely it comes as a very, very useful tool. So the first one is an actual T1 weighted image and the second is an actual T1 fat set image. So in a T1 weighted image, uh, as we see here, the, uh, we see a cyst which is containing hyper intense or whitish or bright fluid in layman terms if we want to use it. So whatever is white on T1 weighted image, 
it can be either fat or it can be blood we can see it with the subcutaneous fat is also looking white and that's how the fat looks in a plain even weighted mr image and even blood would look almost the same so how do we confirm whether it is blood or fat so we go for a t1 fat saturated image where if it is fat it would become black or become dark or become suppressed but the blood would stand out so as we see in this particular case even with t1 fat set image the lesion remains bright whitish or hyper intense so it is clearly pointing out that this is not fat this is not dermoid it is a hemorrhagic cyst typical of endometriosis okay so having said that let's see what are the mri advantages and disadvantages of mri so with mri we have don't have radiation as compared to ct scan but a word of caution that again in first trimester pregnancies mri is not very advisable to use until and unless it is really really uh, indicated and some important advantages there for doing mri otherwise it is best avoided in the first trimester pregnancies second it has got an excellent soft tissue contrast it is uh, very useful as a problem solving tool when ultrasound is indeterminate and it has got a typical chemical signature what do we mean by chemical signature so as we saw in the previous image how mri is able to clearly point out whether the lesion contains fat or it contains blood or sometimes it can suggest whether it is serous fluid or mucinous containing tumor so that's what i mean when i say it has got a typical chemical signature which is very very classical and helpful for us and of course we have diffusion weighted imaging which is very helpful to add certain additional information which is not available with ultrasound or ct scans so that we will see shortly what are the disadvantages of course mri is time consuming a typical mri procedure would cost us at least half an hour to 45 minutes and this may not be feasible in a case of emergency and at the same time it becomes important for the patient to cooperate with us for that much time if the patient has got some non mr compatible implants we cannot do mri and of course in some parts availability of the mri or the cost would also be a consideration okay so let's see how uh, some more adnexal pathologies how it would look on ultrasound and mri so here the first one is an actual ultrasound image trans abdominal image of a patient with dermoid so if you see in the right side posterior to the bladder there is a ecogenic lesion which is how typically fat would look like in ultrasound but here the problem with ultrasound many times what comes is it can be mistaken with a part of the bowel the gas in the bowel also gives the same ecogenic appearance and we can mistake it for a i mean dermoid can be mistaken for a part of the normal gas and it can be missed out so if we need to have a confirmation like we have the second image is that of an actual t2 weighted mr image again of the same patient so it shows in the t2 weighted image also the fat would look bright like any other fluid so it doesn't really characterizes us so here we see a cystic lesion in the right adnexa and then we did a t1 image and a t1 fat set image to confirm the nature of the contents so as i said fat would look bright on t1 weighted image both fat and blood but how should to distinguish between whether it is fat or is it blood so we do a t1 fat saturated image as the second image points out the fat which was there it has become black so that's how the typical mri would give us a chemical information of the contents of the lesion whether it is fat or blood fat would get suppressed blood will not get suppressed blood would remain same bright okay so let's come back to cyst adenoma this was an actual ultrasound image of a patient so when we evaluated we see here a clear cystic lesion with some septations and the suspicious soft tissue so because of the septations and soft tissue we have to think in terms and the size of course we have to think in terms of a cyst adenoma or a cyst adenocarcinoma so whether it is a serous cyst adenoma or is it a mucinous cyst adenoma as ultrasound picture suggests more of a serous cyst adenoma with a clear fluid but when we did mri for this patient we see that the fluid the second image is an actual t2 weighted image of the sorry actual t1 weighted image of the same patient where we see the fluid is not blackish or grayish like how it should be 
similar to urine in appearance. But it is more of whitish appearance, but at the same time, not as white as you see in the surrounding subcutaneous fat. So it's not fat, it is not blood, but maybe, and it is not a serous fluid. So probably it is a mucin containing tumor. That's what we get on MRI. Okay. So the same patient with further images, the second image, if you see, it is a ADC image. Now ADC image is apparent deficient coefficient image, which we'll see eventually more about it. But here in the same patient, if you see anteriorly, uh, in the anterior part of the lesion, if you see a blackish grayish like sort of a thing, and the rest of the fluid is whitish thing. So in an ADC image, when a real deficient restriction is there, it would look grayish or blackish or reduced signal. And this is typical where we have to suspect of a hypercellular soft tissue, which in turn suggests malignancy. As in this case, now it suggests more of a cyst adenoma, adenocarcinoma. Okay. Having said that, now let's come to see some commonly encountered uterine pathologies. So these are the uh, ultrasound images, transabdominal ultrasound images. The first reason is a cross section and the second is a longitudinal section. So here we see a cystic lesion behind the bladder. Anteriorly, we can see the bladder containing a circular spherical like thing, which is the Foley's catheter. And when we see a cystic lesion like this posterior to the bladder and in a longitudinal ultrasound image, it looks like a typical pear shaped structure containing fluid. It is very typical of hematometrocolpus. So uh, it's a very common thing, easy to diagnose. But here the word of caution is there that when the bladder is empty, sometimes we can mistake the cyst for the bladder. And occasionally we can, somebody can mistake the cyst for a fluid filled rectum. So we should ensure that what we are imagining is not the bladder, not the rectum. It is separate from both. And that's how we can make the diagnosis of hematometrocolpus. Now this is <clears throat> sagittal T2 weighted image, the first image, second one is a T1 weighted image, how it would look on MRI. So on the first image, the fluid or blood, it would look again the same bright or white even on MRI. But the second image, T1 weighted image, as we see, it is white or bright or hyper intense as we call it on T1 weighted image, which suggests that yes, which confirms the diagnosis that yes, it is hematometrocorpus. Of course, for the diagnosis confirmation, it is not always required. But if we are evaluating any other suspected additional pathologies, we can go for MRI. Okay. Now let's talk about Nebothian cyst. It's again something very frequently encountered in practically every second patient. We might see Nebothian cyst. So it is a very, very common condition. The first image is a transvaginal ultrasound image where it shows small cyst in the region of the cervix. Now, why are we talking about Nebothian cyst? Because okay, all that is very common. Occasionally, it can re become really big. It can be, have some hemorrhage or it can get complicated and somebody might confuse it with a tumor. So it's important for us to know how a Nebothian cyst would look. And like as we see here in the second image, which is a sagittal star image of a patient in the region of the cervix, we see a sort of a hyperintense lesion with low signal as pointed out by the black arrow, sorry, blue arrow. So if we are not aware of the typical nebotensis, somebody can confuse it with a fibroid or some other tumor or some other complication. But if we see the further T1 weighted image and the T1 fat set image of the same patient, typical in the region of the cervix, we see a cyst, we see hyper intense fluid content. So it is like a hemorrhagic hemorrhage within the nebotian cyst. Coming to adenomyosis, here the first one is an axial transabdominal ultrasound, second one is a transvaginal ultrasound for the same patient. The first image as we are seeing, we see in the posterior myometrium it is bulky, it is inhomogeneous, it is coarse and sometimes you will see some small hyperechoic or cystic fossa in that. It is displacing the endometrium which is really very difficult to differentiate the endometrium from the myometrium in this particular case. But as the blue arrow points out, we can certainly see the endometrium. So this is how a typical adenomyosis picture would look like in ultrasound. And sometimes it can be very easily missed on ultrasound if one is not aware of the appearances. The second is a transvaginal ultrasound confirming the same findings where the posterior myometrium is bulky and inhomogeneous. 
So MRI was done for this patient and MRI is very, very classical and characteristic when we talk of adenomyosis and it is the modality of choice for confirming adenomyosis. So now here if we see the, as the arrow is pointing out that we see a retroverted uterus in the anterior wall of the uterus, we see a normal zonal anatomy, which we discussed in the beginning, a central hyperintense band of the endometrium surrounded by a transitional zone looking at like a hypointense band and then an intermediate signal intensity composition of the myometrium. So this is the typical three zones, normal zonal anatomy, which we can see in the anterior wall it is maintained. But when we see the posterior wall, posterior wall we see that there is no clear differentiation between the junctional zone and the myometrium. So it's a thickened junctional zone, loss of normal zonal anatomy, which is a definite sign of adenomyosis which may be missed upon ultrasound, but it can be easily confirmed with MRI. Another feature, it can have a varied appearance in the MRI also. So like the second uh, image, which is a sagittal section, titubated image, we see again a posterior myometrium, which is bulky, loss of normal zonal anatomy, junctional zone, which is thickened. And in addition, we see multiple tiny cystic spaces in it. So this is how an adenomyosis would look like on MRI. Uh, coming to fibroids or leomyomas, again something a very very common entity which we will see in when we are evaluating female pelvises. So a typical fibroid or a leomyoma would look like a hypoechoic lesion or a low signal lesion compared to the myometrium. This particular case, we see a hypoechoic lesion which is indenting in the endometrium. So it was a submucosal fibroid. So fibroid, it can be myometrial in location, subserosal in location, submucosal in location. And occasionally we can have pedunculated fibroid or a broadly common fibroid, which can become confusing with some other tumors. So that's where, where we should be very careful and we should know how those lesions would look like. So what is the role of MRI in evaluating fibroids? Most of the time we may not need an MRI and ultrasound might be sufficient for evaluating the fibroid. But if there are multiple fibroids, if there is a large fibroid uh, or in other suspected cases, MRI becomes really useful. So it uses the exact size of the fibroids, the number of the fibroids, the location, which would make us a difference in the management options, what kind of treatment we want to offer to the patients. So a typical fibroid would look hypo intense or low signal on a titubated image as seen in the first image, which is an actual image. And the second image is a sagittal situated image. Here we see a small, as the blue arrow is pointing, a fully myometrial fibroid, a large myometrial fibroid which is just indenting upon the endometrium. And we see another a fibroid which is almost practically fully invaginating in the endometrium, which is a submucosal fibroid. Very clearly seen in the second sagittal image also. Okay. So as I was talking of pedunculated fibroid, so what happens is that like in the first ultrasound image, if we see actual transabdominal ultrasound, we see a mass like thing in the cervix. Now, whether it is a CA cervix or some other mass or what is it, we might get confused. But because of the relative circumscribed nature, we might think in terms of a prolapsing fibroid, submucosal fibroid. But how do we confirm that, that we are not dealing with a mass? So the second image is a sagittal stir image of the same patient where we see a mass like well circumscribed lesion in the cervical canal and if we see as the long arrow is pointing there's a clear pedicle which is connecting it with the endometrium and the myometrium so this was a case of a pedunculated fibroid which has prolapsed into the cervix and there is no scope of confusion once we have an mri okay what are the other advantages of having an mri so MRI can also point, out, point us to certain atypical features of fibroids. So like here we see an actual uh, titubated image of MRI and the second is a coronal stir image of the MRI. So here we see multiple fibroids, typically high point in, so low signal on the titubated image. Some of them are showing a heterogeneous appearance because of degenerative changes. But one of the lesions, as we see here at around 10 o'clock position, it is relatively gray or hyper intense or little brighter as compared to the rest of the fibroids. So now this raises us a suspicion 
that this is an atypical fibroid with some atypical features. And this is stands out more clearly in the coronal star image. The second image is the arrow is pointing out to the same lesion. Compared to other fibroids, this lesion is not dark, not low signal. It is showing increased signal. Okay. So we also did diffusion weighted imaging in ADC for this patient. So again, as the blue arrow is pointing towards the atypical fibroid, it looks bright or hyper intense or relatively increased signal compared to the rest of the fibroids. Normal fibroids, they would look dark or low signal on a diffusion weighted image, but an atypical fibroid showing an increased signal on diffusion weighted image and a corresponding ADC image of the same patient. ADC is for apparent diffusion coefficient. It shows a low signal. So why, what is the use of ADC? When we see a bright signal on diffusion weighted image, it is suggestive of a restricted diffusion but whether it is real restricted diffusion or whether it is an artifactual T2 shine through, if we need to confirm, we should look at the corresponding ADC image. If we see a low signal on the ADC corresponding to the bright signal on diffusion weighted image, it suggests that yes, there is a real restricted diffusion. And this restricted diffusion, it points towards high cellularity, which is a feature of suggesting malignancy. So this, in this particular case, we had to suggest that this atypical fibroid may be a hypercellular leomyoma or a leomyosarcoma. Between these two entities, we can't really differentiate radiologically. Okay. Coming to the endometrial polyp, how an endometrial polyp would look like in an ultrasound? So these are transvaginal ultrasound images of a patient. We see an ecogenic tissue which is of the same ecogenistic compared to the endometrium, hyperechoic compared to the myometrium. So that's how when we see like a soft tissue like this, we have to think in terms of endometrial polyp. In this particular case, the blue arrow is pointing out towards the interface between the normal endometrium and the ecogenic endometrial polyp. And on the other side, because of the presence of the endometrial fluid, the lesion really stands out well. In other cases, smaller cases, it might be really difficult, little difficult to pick up. When we do a color Doppler imaging of such a patient, so with the endometrial polyp, we will see a vascular pedicle can be seen. Okay. So we have to differentiate sometimes between polyp versus a submucosal fibroid. So as we have already seen, the first image is a, a transvaginal ultrasound of a polyp. The second image is of a submucosal fibroid. So as I said, submucosal fibroids, they look hypoechoic or low signal compared to the myometrium. So that's why how we distinguish between a polyp versus a submucosal fibroid based on its ecogenicity. And of course, we have got MRA also to confirm the same. Okay. Now coming to endometrial carcinoma. So how an endometrial carcinoma would look like? Here in this case, if we see an actual transabdominal ultrasound image of a patient, as the arrow is pointing out, there is ill-defined soft tissue in the endometrium raising the possibility for an endometrial carcinoma. Now, so the second image is a sagittal T2 image for the same patient. As the blue arrow is pointing out, the white or hyperintense endometrium has got ill-defined low signal tissue in it. This is how an endometrial carcinoma would look like. So again, just to understand the importance of the deficient weighted images in the ADC image, here if we see in the deficient images, the endometrium it is looking bright, the tissue is looking bright, and on an ADC image it is showing low signal which suggests hypercellularity or malignancy. Coming to CA cervix, so here these are actual ultrasound images, uh, actual and longitudinal section. So here we see a large hypoechoic lesion in the region of the cervix, color Doppler image showing vascularity. So the diagnosis is very obvious that it is the case of CA cervix. So what is the role of MRI in such cases and what is the role of CT scan? So this is the digital T2 weighted image and the actual T2 weighted images of the patient with uh, CA cervix. So here as we see, it look, we see a large soft tissue in the region of the cervix. And what is the role of the MRI? We can see anteriorly the bladder very clearly. Posteriorly we can see the rectum and the sigmoid very clearly. So when we have to uh, image uh, for local invasion and staging, that is where MRI becomes really helpful. When we are talking of early staging or early invasion, local invasion, MRI is much better compared to CT scan. So now as we see in the second 
axial tattooed image of this patient here we see that the margins of the cervix are not very clear it is irregular speculated and although the bladder and the rectum are free of the tumor but we see that the tumor is already infiltrating into the surrounding pad so this finding we will not be able to pick up on ultrasound for sure and it would be very difficult to pick up on ct scan also but it is much easier to pick it up on mri so that is where mri stands out better than ct scan if we are talking of local invasion but if we are talking of more widespread involvement peritoneal metastasis or liver metastasis or when we want to simultaneously evaluate the lungs there ct scan is more helpful okay again diffusion weighted image and atc image of the same patient of course in this case the diagnosis is very clear but just for us to understand what is the role and what is the information which a diffusion image can offer to us here we see the same lesion uh, the first one is a diffusion weighted image the arrow is pointing it is bright in signal correspondingly we see a low signal in atc image which suggests that there is restricted diffusion which is a sign of hypercellularity in turn suggesting malignancy okay so just to summarize now in the end ultrasound is the first choice of imaging often sufficient by itself mri is a problem solving tool when ultrasound is indeterminate it has got a typical chemical signature which can tell us whether the contents are fat or blood or it can suggest even mucin characterization of adnex cell masses diffusion weighted imaging it can suggest to certain atypical features and malignancy early malignancy when we want to diagnose when we want to stage and especially local invasion mri is the modality of choice and ct scan is this for much better than other two when we want to evaluate peritoneal metastasis and for evaluating lungs so thank you thank you sir for a very crisp and clear presentation and clearly showing through all the beautiful slides and which investigation we have to choose for each specific condition the topic is now open for discussion we have our gynecologist dr anju also madam can you please add few points to the discussion which you come across in your clinical practice hello Ah, uh, sir. Good morning, sir. Doctor Anju here. Yeah, the presentation was very clear and uh, exhaustive. It was completing all the things. So there's uh, about clinical thing. There's nothing to add in this. But I wanted to ask something, sir. For acute pelvic pain, uh, which is uh, according to the best imaging modality would be ultrasound, right? For acute when a patient comes with acute pain. Yes. But if the patient has come with pain and suppose CT has been done at the first CT scan already has been done, is there any additional advantage in doing an ultrasound after that? Yes. Suppose it is inconclusive and no findings are there. Okay, uh, so thank you, Dr. Anju. Yeah, regarding the patient with acute pelvic pain, as we said that ultrasound should be the first, ideally, because if we are not sure about the sexual history of the patient, menstrual history, then once in a while we may have this danger of evaluating a pregnancy or exposing the patient to radiation in that. So definitely we should avoid CT scan until and unless we are 100% sure that patient is not pregnant. That is one thing. Second thing is if we have already done a CT scan, as we see in the CT scan, the different. Uh, soft tissue contrast between ultrasound and mri compared to ultrasound and mri is not that great for uterus or for ovaries and ovaries can also be difficult to differentiate from the surrounding bowel so definitely we can miss a lot of pathologies and especially if we are doing a plain ct scan if we are not seeing any other cause still patient has got pelvic pain it is always advisable to do an ultrasound okay yes thank you sir Thank you, uh, sir. One more question: In pelvic floor pro prolapse, to evaluate the pelvic floor pro uh, prolapse, which is the is there which imaging would be best for that to I quantify it or check the condition, rectal seal, cystocele, all that? Okay, pelvic floor uh, prolapse. If we want to have some radiological imaging, we have got this dynamic MRI which can be done, which is done for evaluating the pelvic floor and the prolapse. But uh, we are not using in our systems, and we should have the particular software. And of course, it is time-consuming, and we should have proper patient cooperation for that. But otherwise, we can have a dynamic MRI, 
where we can evaluate the pelvic floor prolapse. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Anju. Any more questions? Yeah. Any more questions from the audience or any points to add? So if no more questions, we can conclude the session. So thank you, sir, for a very excellent presentation. And thank you all for participating in our CME. So see you all for the next Sunday CME. The post test as well as evaluation posted in the chat box as well as in AHH WhatsApp group. Please fill up the post test and evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.